As you can see, I'm now joined by uh, Franz Imer and Philip Dutkowski, both from Zurich, and both just walking off stage uh, from the room uh, A2. Congratulations on the great uh, session, Franz. Thank you very much. It yes. was mainly the speakers. Yes, <laughs> but you, you have designed this session together as well. well. Together with David Arias, yes. Yes, yes. So um, what we're going to try to do is uh, connect to our locations in China, because uh, if we can connect to our hub in Beijing, we will have Professor uh, Xi Binyi there, the chairman of the Chinese Transportation Association. And after learning from uh, uh, the state here in Europe, he would now like to give us a little introduction on the progression of DCD on the Chinese side of market. So, Professor Xi Binyi, can you hear me? Personal experience. Really? Networking and learning. It looks like uh, we are not yet uh, talking the to uh, the Chinese the connection. So, uh, as we can see, and they the are broadcasting a promo the video over there. Um, there, the image is changing. And let's see if we can get Beijing up on the screen. This and is see Beijing. if Professor Xi Binyi, if he's ready to give okay. us an update. I'm ready. Because I'm pretty okay. curious to learn whether there are big differences between uh, the Chinese side of things. Yes, Professor Xin Good okay. morning, good afternoon, we should say. Good afternoon, or good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Glad to meet you here in video. This is Beijing, China, and uh, this is Dr. Xi Bing Yi speaking. Uh, now, let me introduce the progress of organ donation and uh, transplantation in China okay, in brief. Since 2010, when the pilot of the voluntary deceased owner organ donation being launched, nation have rapidly developed in China. According to the recent date from the China Human Organ Donation Management Center by October the 31st, 2018, there had been accumulatedly 20,000 385 deceased organ donation visits, 57,905 solid organ donation in the mainland China. In 2007, the total number of organ donation were 5,146, increased by 26 compared to the donation in 2016. Currently, China has the largest number of organ donation in Asia, and it is the second only to the USA in the world. The organ donation coverage rate has increased from 0.03% uh, per million population in 2000. 10 and 3.67 uh, per million population in, 2000, uh, in 2017, increased by 121 times. With efforts in the past 10 years, China's organ donation work had made great progress. However, the quality of the organ donation is still far below the actual clinical needs. According to the National Blood Purification Information Registration System, there were 521,000 dialysis patients in the country by 2016, but only 9,464 patients actually received kidney transplantation in the following year. According to the date from the Chinese Scientific Registration System of Renal Transplantation, CIRKT, which means only one out of 55 dialysis patients was undergone uh, kidney transplantation in China. The supply and the need ratio was only one to 55. Already they tell us that organ donation in China still has a huge potential for future development. Thank you. Thank you. 
Well, thank you, uh, Professor Xi Bin Yi. Thank you for giving us an update. And if, you, if you're just joining us on YouTube, we are now live connected with the ESOT 2019 Congress here in Copenhagen to four different locations in China. And you've just heard Professor Xi Bin Yi, the chairman of the Chinese Transportation Association, giving us an update on the progression of DCD in China. Thank you very much. Um, now I understand, would you like to kick off our uh, interactive Q&A with a first question uh, to Professor Ima? Yes, I'd like to read it. Please go ahead. Okay. Um, Professor Friend Emer, glad to meet you here. I noticed that you are the initiator of the topic DCD push the boundaries. So, what would you like to uh, think the current boundaries of European donation after cardiac days are? Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your question and congratulations to all your activities. It's a pleasure to join you in China. Uh, I think it's a very important topic in Europe and the number of deceased donors could be really increased by those DCD programs all over Europe. And I think that's the most important issue we have actually to get all the countries involved and to adhere to ethical guidelines in this context. Because uh, would you say the ethical boundary, uh, limitations is currently the biggest boundary when you, when you designed the session and you said push the boundaries? Is it mainly about the ethical side of things? That was one of the key messages. That's the reason why we were so happy to have this survey from Europe. Actually, uh, different countries have different modalities, which is mainly based on legal aspects and on, on the perception of DCD donation within Europe. Yeah, because you say... Uh, medically and, and technically, we are ready to, to work further. Well, we, we've heard a great introduction uh, by that as well. Yeah, so it's mainly legally, ethically uh, pushing for it. Absolutely, and the awareness at the level of the hospital is crucial to bring up a DCD program in Europe. All right, well, thank you. And uh, you. now we would like to uh, make a round <laughs> virtually through China and uh, connect with the different locations and uh, get questions. Let's uh, take one question at a time from each, uh, each location. And the first location I would like to connect to is uh, 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 Guangzhou. Are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, they are. Hi, welcome, welcome. Glad you're with us as well. What would you like to, uh, to ask and to whom? We currently have no audio from Guangzhou. I don't know if that's on your side. You get a new microphone, I see, on the table. Yes. Oh, yeah. I just. This is better. Yes, it's still very oh, soft, okay. but could. Yes, now we can hear you. Can you please try again? Uh, I have questions. What is the current status of prevention strategy of a DCD donor derived infection? Well, I'm afraid the question is uh, not coming through, but um, uh, luckily we did uh, prepare. So let, let me uh, pass the question to you, uh, Professor Dutkowski. Um, because what would you say, you, you've, you've explained in your talk the, the role of machine perfusion, and you basically say put all DCD uh, organs on the machine just for, to, to read the new biomarker, well actually not new, but you introduced old research. What does that mean for expanded uh, criteria donation? What, what is the influence of these new opportunities on that? It means that you basically define new uh, all expanded criteria because we rely on a puzzle of risk parameters like donor age and uh, recipient age and others and I think we have to go away from that because we we are wrong in many situations and to look inside of the cells we, we need to understand what happens during the ischemic process which is probably in most uh, in most cases unavoidable except if you go for something which in fact comes from China, and therefore interesting for China, which is called ischemia-free organ transplantation. So if you, if you do that, then of course you, you don't need to assess function, but, but I guess it will only be in some 
some special situations. Because our, our audience in Europe or the Americas who, who don't know about this, how does that work? Ischemia free Ischemia organ Ischemia free organ transplantation was developed by Professor He in, in China. And uh, so that is uh, uh, putting, putting um, donors on machines before you take out organs and continuously pump until you implant. So that's a huge logistic, but it has been done in 15 cases, human cases. And uh, of course, let's say for steatotic livers, you avoid any ischemia exactly. and any mitochondrial injury. But I think we, we, will, we will see several different scenarios for several machine perfusion techniques, and we, we need to apply rules for that. Actually, we, we need to develop regis registries for that, for I think European registries, not even national registries, and uh, to capture the outcome, and then we can compare. And, and just to, to go back to the question about expanded criteria donation, in, in your proposal of, of looking at the FMN marker, would you then say that's the only criteria to consider an organ or not? No, for sure not. This is just a start. Uh, it's a start because we were lucky that this small molecule can be easily captured and, 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 and is released by mitochondria. But, but this is, there are several other options which you can probably measure. It's, it's just the start to do exactly. something. But you would propose to, to move away from criteria yeah. and actually start measuring. Yeah. That yeah. is, that is yeah. the approach see you the function. Uh, Yeah, Exactly. Great. Great. Well, thank you for that. Let's see if we uh, can connect to Zhenzhou. Zhenzhou, I should say. I've been practicing my Chinese city pronunciation. Zhenzhou, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can hear you very clear. Hello. Welcome here in Copenhagen. You uh, Uh, Yeah, you can. I want to ask uh Yumu 呃，意思是脑神经的功能，呃，是不是在捐献前的，是不是都是完全正常的？我想问一下这个问题。Yes, uh, well, thank you very much for your question. Uh, now the challenge is, and I guess this is the uh, does the translation uh, sorry, come here? Sorry, we have a translation from yes. from Beijing. Perfect. Thank you. Please. Um, so we've got two questions. The first question is uh, uh, for uh, uh, Dr. Philip. Um, is there any influence on the FMN level if we use different kind of preservation fluid during the kidney transplantation? No, so the I... influence on the FMN level from the uh, preservation fluid. Um, his second question is that uh, uh, they just mentioned that Spain has uh, increased the number of DCD donors uh, and there are from the uh, controlled DCD. And if you have measured the conscious level and uh, to evaluate the neural state, do you do evaluate these patients on their conscious and neural state level before the donation? Uh, these are the two questions. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for the translation as well. I was a bit worried that we uh, have to uh, go on in Chinese. Let's start with the uh, first question, Professor Dutkowski. Is there an influence on the FMN levels by the liquids used in the uh, perfusion? No. The answer is easy. The short answer is no. There's yeah. no influence. You can has, measure that. has it been researched? Yeah, yeah. So you, you, can, you can measure that basically in any transparent fluid. It needs to be acellular. So if you measure FMN or other fluorescent substances, you, you get disturbed by hemoglobin, bilirubin. So it needs to be an acellular perfusate, but it doesn't matter if it is HDK or IGL or UW. 
or better MPS. Okay, matter. so that, that's good to know, yeah. practical implications. I think uh, let's pass on the, uh, the, the, the microphone to Professor Immer. Uh, Beatrice is not here, but the question was related to her. We saw an, uh, an increase in DCD donation in Spain, and the question was whether the conscious levels are evaluated. I think mainly the conscious level on the, on the ICU um, increased. Uh, I think we are more and more aware that many of our patients staying on the ICU can be considered as a potential DCD donors. More and more hospitals are committed all over Europe, but also especially in Spain, and that's the reason why those numbers increase. It's a question of awareness and of considering uh, that patients staying on ICU as potential donors. So the answer is yes, it's, it's uh, measured Absol very, very Absolutely. much. Absolutely, and uh, this, the programs have also a high acceptance uh, in the hospital setting, and I think that's also a crucial aspect. Uh, the, the teams in the hospital are really committed to, uh, to assist and to help in detecting uh, DCD donors. Perfect. Thank you very much. And thank you, and thank you Jen Zhao, uh, Joe, for this uh, great question. Okay, okay, Let's sorry, uh, sorry, can we uh, just briefly translate the answer to our experts? Of course, yeah. yes. We have a brief Little Dichetai all right. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is a great team effort like this. Um, next up, I would like to connect to uh, Wuhan. I don't know if we can pull those up on the screen and uh, see the crowd over there. Hello, Wuhan. Can you hear us? Hi. How are you? <laughs> We're great. Thank you. We're glad to connect with you. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Philip. Uh, actually, I read most of paper uh, around the perfusion. And uh, this is the first time I heard the uh, data uh, regarding to FMN. I wonder when can we see a paper uh, regarding to the FM data? This is the first question. And also, I, I have the several other questions. OK, we do, we do uh, one by one. I'll give you a second question in a minute. Let's answer this first. The people are looking for the, the, the scientific resources on the FMN foundings. Uh, that's a good question. So we work on this since four years. And uh, the first publication comes in Annals of Surgery in November issue. Human livers uh, measured uh, FMN. And the next paper is submitted uh, about all the basic background and will hopefully come end of the year. But um, if I was listening correctly, you also mentioned that, that the core, the basic science behind this is, is actually quite old. You literally said, yeah. this is old news, we have forgotten. Yeah, true, of course. It is, it is known by biologists, by mitochondrial experts, but not, not from liver experts. And as machine perfusion was not in the focus <laughs> to be honest, 10 years ago, uh, it suddenly uh, showed up now because we have the problem of extreme sick patients and uh, very marginal grafts, and we need to, to enter new pathways, therefore. Yeah. yeah. I, I was standing next to a member in the audience here who were looking at your story as well, and he was wondering, do you, how many... Do you, uh, he noticed that you don't present like I have 500 cases that happen this. How far are you in, in the broader validation of these mechanisms? Ah, so we measured that in 54 cases which we present in the annals paper, but uh, at the moment I guess we have 70 cases and this is not much. It needs to be validated in other centers like Robert Porter's centers uh, in Groningen. He has a lot of DCD on pump and uh, in other organs. So we have good networking here on the Congress, ASOT meeting, and I think in the next year we will have uh, uh, data from other organs and other centers. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Wuhan, did you also have a question uh, for Professor Ima? Oh, okay, okay, may I, may I have <laughs> the, se the second question? Uh, the, uh, based on your paper, uh, you perfuse uh, liver at 10 Celsius and uh, perfuse kidney at four, I wonder what's the reason why you choose a different uh, temperature for different uh, uh, organ. Thanks. Did you capture the question? Um, 
Not exactly. Is it about the the organ procurement being uh, between from two different donors? Y yes, for actually perfuse a liver at 10 Celsius, but uh, for the kidney at four, why uh, choose different uh, temperature? Ah, different temperatures when you procure the organs. Ah, yes. So, so we we are. Yeah, if we do whole procedure, we always uh, perform at 10 degrees for human. In previous experiments, we started in rats and pigs to perfuse uh, livers at 4 degrees. So the reason that we have higher temperature in human was just a machine, because the machine couldn't cool down. That was the reason. And it happened that it works uh, the same. So at the moment, for human livers, we stay at 10 degrees, and it's not clear, is that better, is that worse, but the outcome is good. And I think the key message is you need to be below the Arrhenius breakpoint temperature, which is 14 degrees. If you are below that temp breakpoint, then it's always hypotherm, and I personally don't think that it has advantages or disadvantages. So, so we adjust for the trial in Europe, HOPE trial, a temperature between 8 and 12 degrees. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if, if may I ask uh, the last question? Uh, well, okay. Go in. Uh, last question. Do you have a, a question for <laughs> Professor Imer as well? It's okay. No, no. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, sorry. So this time, I think I, I still I, I still want to ask okay. uh, uh, Dr. Ben. Okay. May? I? Yes. Go. Oh, okay, uh, the last question is, hope can inhibit a uh, cool cell in, uh, in liver, which uh, decrease uh, liver IQ uh, uh, rejection, but how mitigate uh, kidney acute rejection? You mean if we have an influence on downstream immune pathways? Is that the question? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's a, I, I think there's a strong impact on that. But, uh, and we show that also experimentally. In, in human livers, we don't see actually rejection in many liver recipients. So rejection is in principle not the problem. So therefore, uh, I think we have to evaluate that further. But based on the mechanism which we also published, we think we have a strong effect on the immune system and also on the biliary tract. But that's had, that has to be evaluated further. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Wuhan. And as a, as a final stage, I'd like to swing back to Beijing and offer them uh, the microphone to uh, ask questions to our speakers uh, right here. Beijing, can you hear me? Are you there? Hello. This is uh, from Beijing again. Uh, we have many questions based on the three presentations. But uh, uh, as time is limited, I have two short questions. The first question is that uh, according to the uh, first presentation, there are three categories of the DCD. Uh, my question is, uh, I want to confirm the uh, both DCD, uh, control and uncontrolled. Uh, as the, from the first presentation, I think the uncontrolled DCD from the controlled DCD after uh, CPR failure, is that right? This is the first question. The second question is that about uh, the IFM assessment for the liver transplantation. Uh, what about uh, the pathology assessment? There are some questions. Uh, there are some situations, for example, if the uh, metabolic imaging is negative and the pathology is positive, can we use the organ? And, uh, and in the other way, uh, pathology is negative, uh, metabolic imaging is uh, uh, neg uh, positive, uh, can we use the organ? I mean that there are two ways to evaluate the graft, uh, how to use the, the both uh, uh, way to evaluate uh, the graft and to de decide uh, the organ we can use or not. 
Perfect. Thank, thank you very much for your two questions. Uh, we'll we'll uh, answer them first. Let's start with the first question about uh, uh, controlled and uncontrolled DCD. Yeah, it's according to the Maastricht classification. And as you mentioned, uncontrolled is always the failed cardiac resuscitation outside or inside the hospital. And the controlled uh, DCD donation is uh, related to a therapy withdrawal on ICU. So that's the reason why it's controlled. You can time it uh, compared to the uncontrolled where it's unexpected and it's in at the end of the day, a failed resuscitation. That's correct. And, and when you talk about the Maastricht classification, is that a mainly European context or is this broadly international? I can yeah. imagine our Chinese yeah. audience is <laughs> no, not familiar correct. with the beautiful city of Maastricht. <laughs> no, but uh, it's, uh, the, the categories have been published uh, uh, on an international level and that's uh, the usual criteria uh, we use for uh, the classification of, of, uh, of DCD donors, I think, worldwide. Exactly. That's, uh, that, that's how we classify. The second question, uh, uh, Professor Dutkowski, is about the uh, pathology assessment. How do we use or you say we can get rid of that altogether? Yeah, we, we uh, very much appreciate the patholog pathological assessment and we use it in every liver graft, every DCD liver graft. But, but at the moment we rely more on the functional measurement because uh, uh, the, the pathological assessment is only a small, very small amount of liver cells and uh, we can get only messages like healthy hepatocytes and the grade of steatosis and sometimes it's completely wrong, we know that. So therefore, at the moment, we rely more on complete assessment of the function of mitochondria. Thank you very much. Did Thank you, you have a, your, uh, yeah, a follow-up question? Uh, the, the question from Guangzhou have some question, and uh, they want to ask you again. Okay, so we switch back to Guangzhou. <laughs> Quanjo, where are you? We are uh, putting you up on the screen. There you are. Let's, let's hope the audio has improved because... Um, <laughs> can, can you say good morning, good afternoon to us to see if we can hear you? Okay. Uh, let's listen. It's, okay. it's still uh, very, is, uh, very I'll soft. Oh, I'll ask a question. Now you are there. Thank you very much. Yes, glad to hear you. Uh, hey. Oh, okay. Hello. Hello. Uh, yeah. uh, what is the incidence of DDR in DCD compared with DBD? Do you think it's, uh, in the effect of the progresses? How do you think prevent? So your question came through partly. You were talking about donor-derived infections, right, DDI? Yeah, 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 DDI, yeah. And, and what exactly oh, do you want to know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Incident, uh, what is the incidence of uh, DDI in DCD compared with DBD? Perfect, yes. Can we ask that to you, yeah. uh, Professor Immer, what or is, to you? What is DBI? The, so it's the donor-derived infections. And is there a difference yeah. to uh, a DCD or DBD? Donor-derived infections. I don't think that we see a difference. No. No? I don't think so. What do you think? Professor Emer, what, what is your observation? Yeah, there? we had a look at, uh, in kidney transplantation, and in fact, there was no difference uh, in terms of uh, donor-derived infections in the recipient. Is, it, is there an, an increased risk? I try to understand why the question is there. Of course, in DCD donation, you have some additional manipulation with the machine, uh, which may have an impact on donor-derived infection or even manipulation-related infection. But we have a, a close follow-up, uh, and we didn't detect any issue, at least to my knowledge. Yeah, there, there's not a single uh, proof of uh, contamination of the perfusion fluid, for example. But I have to say, this is all <clears throat> in Switzerland, or in my hands, is always hypotherm. So if you do hypothermic perfusion techniques, of course, the risk of some growth is very small, very small. It may be different in normothermic techniques that we don't know. Exactly. That is, that is to be uh, discovered. OK. Thank you, uh, Guangzhou. D did you have another pressing question now that we have your audio fixed anyway? No. No? No? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. No, thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, you very you. much. Well, officially, this also uh, ends our uh, coffee break time. So I'd like to, uh, one more time, very much express our thanks to uh, Roche Pharmaceuticals for hosting and, and supporting this virtual connection between the Far East and us here in Copenhagen. I'd like to thank Hello? all the... Hello? Oh, yes. Can you hear me? 
Yes, we can hear you. <laughs> Who are you and where are you? I can have, have another question. Thank sure. You. In which location uh, are you, can yeah. you say? Ah, in Beijing. Yeah, we see you now. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, we have, uh, I have a question for Dr. Philip. And uh, uh, as we know in the textbook, uh, we, can, we can know that um, by preser preserving uh, organs in uh, low temperature, we can have a very slow uh, metabolism. So the oxygen can, consume, cons uh, yeah, yeah, consumes less. Uh, but in the uh, hope uh, perfusion mode, uh, how, we, how do we know uh, that the, uh, how, how much oxygen do we need to provide to the, to the organ? This is the first question. Let, and let, the us, second. let us clarify, because your question started off really clear and then near the end it got weird. So it's the difference between the slow metabolism that's uh, observed in uh, hypo... No, no, no. Okay. I, I want to know how much oxygen do we need to ah. pro provide to the organ during the HOPE uh, yeah. mode? That is clear. That came through. Thank you very much. So, yeah. uh, what about yeah. the oxygen levels in the in the hope procedure? Oh, very high. Yeah. So, so we we use 80 kilopascal, which is very high. We know that for livers, for especially DCD livers, the metabolic need is high. So, if you don't oxygenate at this level, the oxygen in the perfusate will disappear after let's say one hour. Therefore, we start with 80 kilopascal and we don't see much levels of oxidative stress. For kidneys, that may be different. Yeah, but in livers, because they, are, they have a huge amount of mitochondria and usually 1.5 kilogram, so th therefore we start with high oxygen content. And we have also no erythrocytes, so we need to, um, to perfuse with a high amount of soluble oxygen to, to get uh, ischemic cells uh, conditioned. That's the reason. Yeah, do, do you think we need to provide uh, extra oxy oxygen during the transportation uh, after, the, after harvesting the donor, after harvesting the, the organ, uh, do we need to provide continuous supply of oxygen to the, to the liver? Is it better? Thank you. All right. Uh, this is an interesting question. In principle, of course, it makes sense to start a perfusion as early as possible. But from practical reasons, uh, we prefer to do that endoschemically. So we leave the procurement as it is, transport the organ. We are lucky in Switzerland. Uh, organ transport can be done in all cases within, I would say, for sure, for in, within six hours. And I don't think that's a huge difference if you start after one hour cold storage or after six hours cold storage. And therefore, we keep the, the practice, which is extremely easy to, to let the organ procurement like it is, transport the organ to the center, and then apply machine perfusion in the center. That, that ease the things, therefore. Yeah, so you, you say you do the perfusion at the uh, recipient center. Exactly. Exactly, and so then there's no use to oxygenate during transportation. Exactly, no transport of machines, but of course you can do it different. There are machines on the market which can be transported and can oxygenize during transport, but it's a high amount of logistics and also cost, and uh, I don't think it's necessary, therefore. But I can imagine in China the distances are much larger. Of course, in, so it in might China have... and US that may be different. And uh, we have here on the ESOT also other machines which are able to perfuse and with continuous oxygenation during transport. Yeah, it's possible in the future. Let, let me. Uh, so, so do you think it's uh, benefit, beneficial for the organ if we provide some substance con containing ox extra oxygen in the uh, perfusate uh, while transportation, not using machine, but some kind of uh, substance that can hold many oxygen in it. Yeah, you mean some carriers? It, it, it is possible that this is beneficial, but it has not been uh, investigated. So that no. this is unclear at the moment. Uh, I think the, based on our results, it's probably not needed if you do anti-schemic oxygenation, but we, we need to evaluate that. Is, is, there, is there any indication in science which could lead to the practice of the more oxygen, the better, or is that not a... 
Not that, sound. Uh, it, that depends, of course, from the amount of ischemia and uh, on, on the temperature. So if you introduce oxygen basically to, to human cells or animal cells, you, you get some mitochondrial injury. Always. Always. Uh, so therefore, oxygenation has also a side effect. Exactly. So you yeah? should so, be careful with so that. So therefore, we, we need to understand that fully and to measure that during perfusion. Perfect. Thank you very much for your clear questions. Let me just uh, do a household check, because uh, on our 24-hour broadcast, we go back into room A1. But I must say, I'm very happy that this is all working now. Do you have to urgently be somewhere in the next five minutes? And you, Professor Dutkowski? Five minutes. Yeah? No? Oh, Can you stay? Yeah. yeah. Because then I, I'd like to open up to China. If, if, if there's anybody in any of the four locations who would like to take the opportunity that everything is now technically working and we are here, uh, let us know if there's any questions. Just start waving, raise your hands, or start talking into your microphone and we'll pull you up. Anyone in, perhaps in Wuhan or in Guangzhou, Zhengzhou, Beijing? Wuhan. Yes, Wuhan. I was expecting you guys to come back. <laughs> welcome <laughs> welcome back. It? Yes, welcome back. Please. Uh, 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 okay. Uh, I have a question for Dr. Philip. So, what's your opinion on HMP and uh, HMP and NMP? I mean, uh, in, the near, in the next five to ten years, which one uh, 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 which one are better or uh, has a big, uh, big marketing? You mean comparison of normal thermic versus hyperthermic? Uh, yes, HMP and the NMPI. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm not unbiased in this question. <laughs> I, I would say uh, at the moment it is unclear. But as I showed, normal thermic perfusion works very good in healthy organs. If organs are exposed to long ischemic periods, then you will have a problem during normal thermic perfusion as in, evo, in vivo and ex vivo. And therefore, I think we, we need to evaluate the, the, the yeah, the the effect of hyperthermic perfusion compared to normal thermic perfusion in randomized trials. And uh, we don't have that yet. We will have the result of the first hyperthermic trials in the next year. The first normal thermic trial has been finished, and in future, we will have to compare it. And, and you say, I'm not biased, so where's your favor? Uh, of course, I'm, I'm, I'm a cold oxygenated guy, so, <laughs> so <laughs> I like the sun, but <laughs> for livers and kidneys, I like the cold, of course. And, and why? Why does that make your life uh, easier? Yeah, because uh, uh, our research shows that the injury is less if you oxygenate exactly. in the cold. So, the, but that has to be proven, and if you want to convince Others you need nowadays to provide randomized trials. So therefore we will have that, I guess. Exactly. Good. Thank you, uh, Wuhan, for that additional question. Um, I think with that, we're kind of going to stick to the time because our audience is China has also been sitting there very long. So let me once again thank you all in uh, all four different cities. Thank you, Guangzhou. Thank you, Zhengzhou. Thank you, Wuhan, and thank you, Beijing, especially Professor Xi Bingying. Thank you for sharing the update on the progression of DCD in uh, China and preparing that. And uh, thank you also once again kindly to Roche Pharmaceuticals for making this all possible, hosting you guys in the four different cities and connecting here live with Copenhagen. Thank you, Professor Immer, for comp uh, compiling this very interesting session of a obviously hot topic, and uh, I think we'll be learning more from that. Thank you, uh, Professor Duskowski, for you. being with us and the very passionate talk you've uh, delivered on stage. <laughs>